All right, this message for you, Keith. Congratulations on getting your first stripe on your white belt in karate. See, hard work pays off. You can achieve anything as long as you set your mind to it, set goals and achieve those goals day after day after day. If you're afraid that you're not gonna rank up in your belts, you're wrong. Don't be negative, be positive, believe that you can do it. I know you can do it. Between the links, know you can do it. They believe in you, we all believe in you. You just gotta work hard. Hard work pays off no matter what. I became the world champion of Bolton Fighting Championship after a year and a half of competition. Yeah, I had a background in wrestling, but I still had to learn jujitsu and kickboxing and boxing. I had to learn these things to become a champion. And to learn these things, you gotta put in the hard work. So like I say, I believe in you. Between the links believe in you, you can become anything you want. Just with hard work, discipline, and dedication. I know you can do it. So I wish you luck. Coming from me, Tito Ortiz. The links. How impressive was Colby Covington's performance against Robbie Lawler in the main event of UFC Newark? And also, did Colby Covington cross the line with his post-fight interview? We put a bow on UFC Newark by talking about the undervalued story of the card. Chris Cyborg and Dana White's story seems to have come to an end. Plus, we take a look ahead to UFC Uruguay coming up on Saturday. All that and much more coming up tight on Between the Links. All right, welcome back to a brand new episode of Between the Links on the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network and the Loudmouth MMA YouTube channel. My name is Mike Heck. I am the host of this program, and I also have the daunting task of trying to keep all these people in line as we discuss some of the big stories going on in our favorite sport of mixed martial arts. Let us introduce the panel, and we'll fire away here. Introducing first, and if you guys didn't know this already, this man got a touching, inspirational, and motivational video sent to him by the longtime former UFC light heavyweight champion, Tito Ortiz. And I have a feeling that he's going to be inspired this week like never before. Keith Schillen, what a weekend it was for you. How did you respond to that video? Well, I mean, it was amazing to have a, I mean, a hero, I would say, a inspirational person like the Huntington Beach bad boy congratulate me on, on my great achievement. And listen, guys, I'm bringing it this week because – when you get your first stripe on your white belt, you're no longer a loser. You're ready to come. I'm, so you guys, you crack all those jokes all you want, but you better watch out, man. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing business now, now that I'm, that I'm a white belt. You can follow me um, at Keith Schillen, MMA, Keith Schillen MMA on Twitter. I write for SureDog, Cape Side Press, and Fansided, and I do a whole bunch of podcasts with Live Month MMA Podcast Network. We have Davidson Baker here who got to play co-host on another show on the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network the other day. Is that accurate, Davidson? It is. I had a good time uh, filling in as not like the proverbial Sunday morning cornerman, but on Sunday morning corner because there was only one Sunday morning cornerman. But um, I had a good time doing that with Keith um, on, well, technically Saturday night. Uh, you guys can check that out on that podcast as well. You can find my stuff Fan sided, uh, Cage Side Press, and my MMA News. And for those who didn't know, Davidson just celebrated a birthday. Happy birthday, sir. Thank you very much, my friend. Craig Allen is here, one half of the ranch drinking tag team champions of the MMA world, according to the YouTube trolls. How are you, Craig? I'm glad you brought that up because I have another great comment from Reddit. So we predicted Covington Lawler. We both said that Colby Covington was going to get a decision win. We were both really impressed with his performance. And we were told, horrible video, two clueless tool bags. So, I mean, it could have been worse. But, uh, yeah, you can find us at Craig Allen FNP at Fight Night Picks. You can find those videos on uh, YouTube if that sort of thing interests you. And we are making history this week on Between the Links. The first female in the history of the show is joining the panel, and we know she will fit in just fine with this crew of absolute misfits. Kristen King is here. Welcome, Kristen. Let everyone know where they can find you and your great work via the World Wide Web. <laughs> well, thanks for having me, guys. Um, I write for Fansided, and you can always find me at Kristen King MMA on Twitter. All right. And for a full list of rules, Head back into the archives of the podcast network. That is, if you are new to the show, for those who are not new to the show, you already know how this thing works. The rebuttal clause, as always, is in full effect using the chat. Here we go. Let us kick things off with UFC Newark, which took place on Saturday at the Pru. More specifically, let's talk about the main event. Colby Covington 
took on Robbie Lawler. And a lot of people thought that this could be a very interesting fight. I was one of those people. I did expect Covington to take Lawler into the deep rounds and win a decision, but I did. I, I certainly did not expect a 25 minute domination from start to finish in this fight. This is a one-sided shellacking with all due respect to Robbie Lawler as Colby Covington out wrestled, outpaced, outworked, and, and even outstruck Robbie Lawler en route to a unanimous decision win. That is my take on the fight. Let's see what Craig Allen thinks to kick things off. Craig, what did you think of Colby Covington's performance? And in terms of what you thought would happen coming into this fight, did he exceed match up to, or did he underperform based on your expectations? Totally exceeded my expectations. I mean, from one clueless tool bag to another, really. I mean, <laughs> I had predicted, of course, that this was going to be a, a decision win for Covington, but you always had to keep in the back of your mind as we were reminded time and again by Cruz and Anik that yes, Robbie Lawler has powerful hands and you have to worry about that. There's a chance it could be a knockout. But realistically, Lawler in that fight, he kept that left hand cocked, but he never really threw it. So as far as Colby Covington's performance, yes, it was record setting. Yes, there was talk before the fight that the winner of this would most likely get a title shot. And you can go back into the archives, like Mike said, and listen to my take on it. I thought that Masvidal really deserved a shot. And Keith absolutely shot that down. And rightfully so. Keith was right there. Covington deserved the shot. Former interim champ. He's been away for over a year just due to an injury layoff and realistically he comes out looking great. Plus you have to factor in the fact that he shouldn't have even been allowed to fight with the cut that he had on his eyebrow. He's able to kind of fake and weave his way through the commission to get that fight to go all the way through. And listen, I mean, he put on a master class. So I think a fight against Usman is what we really deserve. And uh, yeah, I mean, he really exceeded my expectations in that fight. Kristen, your thoughts on Colby's performance and based on your expectations heading into the fight, how did Colby perform? Yeah, I thought he performed as expected. I didn't feel like it underwhelmed me or exceeded my expectations at all. I feel like a lot of people may not give Colby a lot of credit, especially when it comes to er certain areas of his fight game, like his striking, but that has always been improving. And you saw that. Obviously, the takedown was always going to be there. He always has a good, um, he'll always have wrestling to rely on. But the problem is he doesn't have to rely on that solely anymore. So you saw in the opening rounds, the first and second round, he went for the takedown against Robbie, which is essentially something that most wrestlers would be able to do against a guy like Robbie Lawler. And then for the third, fourth, and fifth round, you kind of just saw him stand and strike with him because at that point, he knew that he could do that to Robbie Lawler. So I felt like this is exactly the kind of Colby Covington that he has grown into. And the expectations were just it was right in the middle. We knew exactly what he was going to do. Um, I didn't think it was surprising at all. I think everyone had that same mindset that, hey, maybe there is a chance for Robbie to come back and knock him out. And that was always a possibility, as Craig said. Uh, but it just didn't really happen. And, and Colby looked really, really good. And I definitely think he's a problem for a lot of people. I know his shtick may turn a lot of people off and stuff like that, but you really cannot deny that he is an absolute talent at welterweight. And that's exactly what the uh, division needs. So I thought he looked great on a Saturday night. Yeah. It was also interesting based on what you just said, Kristen is Colby shut down round five, Robbie Lawler, the most terrifying guy in the sport, in my opinion, Keith, what were your thoughts on, on Colby's performance in the cage? I mean, he far exceeded. I, I don't know what Chris is talking about saying everyone expected that. I mean, I predict Kobe coming to win. I didn't expect him to do what he did. I mean, think about what the, the narrative about Kobe coming was. There's people who called him the worst striker. There's people who said that he got outstruck by Damian Meyer, even though the stats didn't say that he almost doubled Damian Meyer in, in significant strikes. But think about Robbie Lowe. It was supposed to be wrestler versus striker. Kobe Covington threw 540 strikes, the most in the history of a UFC fight. He landed 179 significant strikes, the fourth most all-time in a fight, with big wrestling involved in that. The most strikes in the history of the welterweight division was landing that night. He, he, he landed more strikes against Robbie Lawler than he did against Damian Meyer and RDA combined. He had 10 takedowns. That, that made him become the second welterweight in history with George St. Pierre, which is a, probably a good group to be with, to have two fights with at least 10 takedowns. Think about this. Johnny Hendricks went against Robbie Lawler twice. That's a three time, uh, a two time NCAA champion, three time uh, finalist. Josh Koscheck, NCAA champion. Matt Lindland, Olympic silver medalist. Colby Covington took down Robbie Lawler more times than those three all time great wrestlers did in four fights 
combined. To say that anybody expected Colby Covington to do a to drop a 50-44, and I actually think people were being nice to Robbie Lawler. It could have been worse. I mean, come on. Colby Covington had one of the greatest performance in the history of the sport for a full 25 minutes. And you know what happened is there's so many haters out there that don't want to give him credit because he was amazing on uh, Saturday afternoon. Davidson Baker, like the old song says, we go and save the best for last. Your thoughts on Covington's performance on Saturday? It also exceeded my expectations as well. Here's a couple things that continuously get thrown around that I didn't really see. While Robbie Lawler obviously is dangerous whenever he's under duress and or taken to deep waters, I said this on Sunday Morning Cornerman as well, you could tell Robbie Lawler was really just look like bobbing, 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 looking for that KO strike, uh, particularly towards the end of round three. But every time that he thought he had an angle, it was jab, 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 like kick to the body, like rope, like inside leg kick. He was never able to not even get into a rhythm to land that shot. He wasn't even like able to get into a rhythm to set that shot up. Statistics aside, and as lucrative, it, according to the stats, he had, he had thrown the most significant strikes in the history of not just the welterweight division, but all divisions in the UFC. And then you add in the takedowns. I mean, I knew that we were going to see a cardio machine. I didn't know that we were going to see a cardio machine, you know, that resembles what he says he sets it up with in the bedroom or whatever he says. However, yeah, man. I mean, I was just absolutely thoroughly impressed. I, I don't, I don't get how they could give a title shot to anybody else. I mean, if they gave it to Masvidal, I'd be like, okay. But at the same time, I really, really want to see that fight between him and Kamaro. He, he blew me away on Saturday and rightfully so. What I found super fascinating about that fight is, you know, fourth, fifth round, I kind of expect uh, Colby to land some more strikes, but in the second round, not only was Colby Covington landing strikes, he was running his mouth to Robbie Lawler the second half of that round, he decided not to wrestle in the second half of the second round and just pieced him up. I couldn't believe it. It was a fantastic performance for Colby Covington and uh, good performances by all of you guys as well. Keith with 10, Davidson, Christian, and Craig with nine points apiece. And you knew that we were certainly not going to move ahead with any other topic when it comes to Colby Covington without discussing his post-fight interview, more so his opening words of that interview uh, with John Anik, after being asked about his performance, Colby said, and I quote, let's talk about the lesson we learned tonight that Robbie should have learned from his good buddy, Matt Hughes. You stay off the tracks when the train is coming through, Junior. Doesn't matter if it's the Trump train or the Colby train. Stay out of the way. Now, Matt Hughes did respond. He just kind of shunned it off, more or less, but he praised Covington's performance. He took the high road here. But when Colby was asked by the media about the comments made towards Matt Hughes, Covington said he had no regrets, and he said, did I say something that was offensive? The guy's done some pretty crappy stuff. He's got lawsuits against his family, against his brother. I just said the truth. I'm honest. I'm a little bit brutally honest sometimes, and, if people, and people can't handle it. If people were worried about words, but we go in the octagon to try to kill each other, don't be so sensitive snowflakes. Now, be that as it may, Colby isn't wrong there, but sometimes that just isn't enough to, to justify what somebody says. So with all that in play, Kristen King, we're going to start with you. Colby is the biggest heel in MMA right now. I mean, I know we throw that term very loosely on this program, but Colby is playing the role. He is embracing being the heel, and that's just who he is. That's why he is where he is right now. But do you think he crossed the line on Saturday during his post-fight interview? I mean, you could definitely make the argument that he did. I honestly understand everyone's point when they say, well, Matt Hughes is a terrible person. And you can definitely make that argument with all of the accusations and all of the stories that are levied against him. Um, but I still don't believe that that's OK for you to use as a reason to be a dick. And that's exactly what Kobe did. And I understand that you're playing into this heel role and stuff like that, but it just it seems really distasteful to take something like that. Um, a lot of people claim that it is, it was an apparent suicide attempt. And I think that that's a lot, uh, that's triggering for a lot of people. And, um, you know, I wish I had the same response that Matt Hughes did where he just kind of shunned it off and, and he gave credit to Colby and I could do the exact same thing, but it's just, it's really uncomfortable hearing something like that. And I guess that's just the name of the game right now. You know, when things become sensationalized, um, that's all that they ever talk about, you know, and that is what's 
worrisome about someone like Colby Covington and especially in the direction that he's heading. There's obviously that showdown with um, Kamaru Usman happening and we are in a current political climate that is not the best right now. And you could already see the, the seeds being laid out for that. And you saw that in the post fight interview on the ESPN plus desk. And it just worries me that the two taboo topics when people talk to you are religion and politics. We've already seen how religion was uh, taken with Khabib and Connor. And now we have the politics game and it's going to probably be brought up a lot on the road to the Kamaru and Colby fight. Um, so for me, I feel like he did cross the line a little bit, but I understand why people think it's okay to justify that behavior. It's part of the entertainment uh, aspect of the sport. I just feel like sometimes um, not everything needs a narrative. You, you can sell the fight on its own. You really don't need to do that over the top kind of shtick. It, sometimes it doesn't have to be like that. So I felt like he did, but a lot of people might disagree with me and call me a snowflake, but I, I guess that just means I have a lot of decency. I don't know. Speaking of habitual line crossers, Keith, your thoughts. Well, first I got to correct Kristen again. She said the political climate was, was wrong. Listen, you better not tell Colby that because the Trump train will come through and take you out. Kristen, you should have learned that. Uh, listen, I think, I think everything Colby is doing is absolutely perfect. He wants to be hated. If you're going to play the villain, then play it. Go all the way in. He wants us to ask the question, did he go f- too far? He's going to continue to push that line until he says something racist, something homophobic, something. But as long as he doesn't go that far and just keeps getting that, like, ooh, should I? Like, the perfect response is, like, ooh, should I have said that? That's what he wants. Now, listen, the, the Matt Hughes – listen, Matt Hughes has done terrible, terrible things – that said, he's still a father. He, he's still a husband. As Kobe has pointed out, not a good father, not a good husband. But listen, the guy almost died. But if you're going to play the villain, why not take a jab like that? Um, everything he keeps doing between the Kurt Angle to get the whole arena to be chanting, you suck. Um, from the sunglasses, the like three stripper girls carrying the belt around staying like corny Camaro fake Usman and all, and all this stuff. I think he's perfect. And even the taking the Trump angle, and I'm not going to get political, but Trump obviously is a polarizing figure. You either voted for him and like him or you didn't and you hate him. By being this over the top and playing into that like hardcore right wing stereotype gun swing, like you're a snowflake, get out of our country, like being that all the way to the right personality you are, you are instantly taking 50% of America and having them hate you. Have how many people in Europe and Canada and all these other countries hate you. And that's what Colby wants. I think he needs to continue this. I can't wait for him to get on Twitter and like ruin somebody's movies telling about what happens in the, the ending of The Lion King and, and stuff. But the best thing, I actually think by being this much of a savage, I actually think he's going to gain some fans. The fans that like kind of thought it was corny are going to be like, Oh shit! No, he didn't. Like, did he really just say that? How many people hate Kobe Covington to go? Holy shit! He just he just said that about Matt Hughes and like, damn, dude, that guy don't care. I think that's funny. You go on Star Wars and you give me the ending of Star Wars. I don't care. I don't watch that shit. Cool. It's funny. People, yeah, you know, I'm just leave it that because I don't. You start getting too far. But listen, I think he's brilliant. And we asked a question a mo- uh, Was it last month? When Jorge Masvidal had that unbelievable one international fight week with a five-second knockout, he, you know, this guy got the bigger uh, headlines than John Jones and Amanda Nunes. We said, what can Colby Covington do to get the title fight? It's like seems like it's gift wrapped for Jorge Masvidal. He just did it. It was amazing. Like I guess I can't say it again. I'm, Kobe's performance was amazing. All right. And to, to, to go to the chat here about tonight being pride rules and the timer not being on, uh, here's the deal, folks. We're on a new platform. I had the Skype record that would time everything for me. I don't have that now. So I have to go back old school and just bust out my cell phone and I have to start timing that way. We're going to let things fly. Pride rules for another round here as we go to Davidson Baker. So Davidson can take all the time he wants, I guess. Thank you. Um, I'm somewhere in between the middle of all of it. However, I, I'm going to go back to something that I said uh, a few episodes of this show ago. The reason why I didn't want Greg Hardy to go full heel was because he hadn't dipped his toes in that water, so to say. You know, Greg Hardy has done that, like, you know, gone about his business type of thing. Colby Covington is the exact opposite. If you do decide to go full heel, 
that's that's the choice you're making. You cannot waver back. You cannot have second thoughts. If you are going to go full heel and let that you know villain character you've created of yourself carry you market wise the way you intended it to, you can't just dip your you can't just dip your toe in the heel back toes in the water and kind of try it out per se. You've got to go all in on it. And as far as the Matt Hughes comments are concerned, I'm kind of in the same boat as Keith. Yeah, I mean, obviously Matt Hughes has not done the greatest things. He's even alluded to that somewhat himself in his own book. Um, However, all of that being said, Colby has chosen this for himself. And Colby, Colby has decided to walk along this path and it all kind of it, it was a little bit before this but let's let's remember it hasn't been very long since he called a arena full of brazilians filthy animals and was pegged with drinks and hot dogs and had people trying to come to his hotel room and security on the outside of it i mean this is this is the path that he has chosen to walk along and this is exactly what he has planned himself. And so much to the point where, as I've said in the past as well, I can kind of notice where his one-liners, he, he again mentioned today that the UFC is not the ultimate feelings championship. I've heard that a few times in the past. It, he's doing a great job with keeping his shtick consistent. On the morality side of things, Was did it kind of jar me a little bit that he commented on Matt Hughes? Yes. Did it make me lose any sleep no craig we go to you and you have been very vocal on this program saying that the ufc is you know essentially and i'm probably putting words in your mouth not the ultimate fighting championship but ultimate fighting entertainment have we crossed the line have we crossed over past the entertainment are we like on the other side of the country right now when it comes to colby covington well, Mike, I'm not in your country, and as a Canadian, I have zero idea what we're talking about. I mean, I don't understand these politics. Who are these people? Come on! I don't know. We have Justin Trudeau and Beavers and Moose. I, I have no idea what's going on. No, realistically, I mean, I have to disagree with our first uh, comment. I mean, Kristen, if you're going to sell a fight like this, and you've got a guy with 62.7 million Twitter followers tweeting about this, Dana White's going to cash in on it. They have two of the Trump boys sitting front row. you got to put them on camera before the fight. It helps sell it. And yes, you're going to ostracize about half your audience, like he said. But realistically, it worked well. And to get back to the question, I mean, did Colby Covington cross the line? Matt Hughes quote after it, and Mike, you alluded to it. Reminder, though, this is the fighting world. People trash talk, and you got to have thick skin. So let's go back a little bit. John Jones popped for PEDs, and then he went back and made a rhino dick pill joke. Um, Conor McGregor can ruin an entire fight card for dozens of people, and then he can call a different fighter a rat, and he can mock their accent. You go back to Colby Covington. He's been playing this heel persona, and why not trash talk an icon in the process and build your star out of it? We saw that this weekend. I don't have to look at stats to do that. The guy's going to get a title shot. He can carry around his interim belt. He was on a show that we won't name because it's not on the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network, but the Ariel Hawani show today, and he really pushed for that title shot, and I think he deserves it. So realistically, it, you can't go too far. We're talking about cage fighting. It's not croquet. I actually went back this morning and listened to an old interview I did with Colby Covington before he fought Dong Hyun Kim, and I wanted to see the difference between this Colby Covington and that Colby Covington, and the difference was that Colby Covington was much angrier he was the same trash talking kind of a guy, but you know, obviously the Trump stuff was out of it. The politics stuff was out of it. It was more serious. This is a guy that literally for a long time couldn't get anybody to fight him. And he was angry about it. This is a guy that a couple of years ago went viral because he went on the street with a sign, like a homeless person saying, looking for a fight, somebody give me a fight. And now look at him. He's in this position. It took a long time, really, if you think about it, to get to this point, but here he is. But I want to follow back up with all of you because, you know, I tweeted something out after that post fight in the booth between Covington and Kamar Usman, and a couple of you guys touched on it. But personally, I don't want to see these two trash talk for the next few months because it's horrible. Like, I understand that Colby talking is just going to create more enemies and more people dislike him. I understand that. But it's just like, this is beyond Cejudo. This is beyond cringy when you have these two, because neither of them are very good at it when it comes to going back and forth with each other. They just don't mesh well together in that scenario. There's enough history where the old pro wrestling adage of, you know, no contact until they get in the ring or the cage will be more of a build, in my opinion, than trotting these two guys out to press conferences and media calls and media luncheons and all this other stuff 
and things like that. Agree or disagree, Craig Allen? Should we silently build up to this fight, just book it, you know, let them do individual interviews here and there and get to this fight? Or do we have to put them in this situation where they have this horrible, cringy trash talk back and forth for two months? Uh, Mike, come on, man. I mean, like, do you want me to take the Canadian side again? And I can go the George St. Pierre route. I was not impressed by your performance. So do you want that? Or do you want these guys going at it for a couple of months trying to sell a fight? I enjoy that. Listen, as MMA fans, we know what we're going to get in that fight. Two of the best wrestlers, pure wrestlers in the sport. They can chain wrestle. They can point fight. They can volume strike. It's going to be exciting. Having them go back and forth. I mean, what's our alternative? Ben Askren? Yeah, that would have been fun. Jorge Masvidal? Yeah, that would have been fun. But we're going to get to see him against Leon Edwards. And those guys already have a beef. So realistically, I think Covington and Usman, it's just going to build and build and build. And maybe once again, to go back to that number, you get a guy with 62.7 million followers tweeting something very, very nasty about it. And suddenly the UFC is a lightning rod. ESPN's able to cash in. Dana White's able to cash in. And Colby Covington, if I'm not mistaken, was the third highest paid fighter on the card this weekend. So maybe it can add a little bit more money into his uh, his pocketbook because I know Robbie Lawler made twice as much as he did. So I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm fine with it. Yeah, these two guys might be cringy, so to speak. But I mean, Henry Cejudo's got two belts and he's hanging out with Brazilian models right now. So what what can the worst part of it be? I guess I'll agree with you in one sense. If it's the main event of a card, maybe, maybe. But if it's a co-main event, if it's a John Jones main event, you don't even need them to talk at all. It's so bad. It's just awful. What do you think, Davidson? I'm going to proceed Keith right away because I know how he feels about this fight status. It, this could be a main event. It could be um, depending on, depending on who obviously would be booked on, you know, the, the correlating card. It, it could be a main event, however, and it is, and it easily would deserve it. How, however, I mean, I'm, I'm siding with Craig as well here. I definitely, don't mind these two being at the forefront of the trash talk. Cause I mean, like I'll, I'll pen an example that people really try to ignore all the time in terms of bad trash talking. At least we don't have Cody Garbrandt trash talking. Have you ever heard that guy try to talk trash? Oh my God. But there, there are stipulations and obviously things that come along with a fight between two guys that have history and obviously, these two do have it. As Kamara said at a previous press conference, they're 20 miles apart. And when you do have these kind of oncoming, not so much hype trains, but let's just use those words just to make my analogy make sense, and they're coming towards each other, yeah, cashing in on that is, is your best option to do so. So, no, I don't think that we need to do just media scrums and interviews here and there. No, get, ju- milk these guys for as much as you can as far as the extracurriculars are concerned. Keith, your thoughts. Well, first of all, what the hell is Davidson talking about? Like, it could be a main event of a pay-per-view. We, we've been doing this show for 45 minutes. All we're talking about is Kobe coming and coming out. Maybe it could be. TJ Dillashaw and Joe Soto was a main event of a UC pay-per-view. You think, oh, that Usman and Covington could be? Covington's getting tweeted out by the most powerful man in the world, and you don't think he gets pay-per-view main event? I mean, Davidson, you've said some dumb stuff on the show, but being surprised right now is even worse. Now, you ask, like, do you want to see this trash? Yeah, I want to see this trash talk. And so does everyone else. You know what? You want proof? ESPN on their YouTube, on their replay of the post fight show that's on ESPN Plus that nobody watches, had 1.5 million, pay- uh, million clicks. That's not counting the people who actually watched it live on ESPN Plus or watched it on MMA Junkie or SureDog or fans or whoever else, all the other people that had the videos. That's crazy numbers. We, we pretend we don't want to see it. Me and Davison didn't start taping our post-fight show until we saw them trash talk and see what, make sure what happened. Um, whether it's good trash talk or bad trash talk, we still want to watch. You don't believe me? Tito Ortiz and Ken Shermick has one of some of the worst trash talk in history. That pay-per-view – Actually, people don't know this. UFC 40, before the Ultimate Fighter, kept the UFC to make it to the Ultimate Fighter show because of Ken Shamrock and Tito Ortiz. Tito Ortiz, Chuck Liddell, terrible trash talk, one of the biggest pay-per-views ever. Brock Lesnar, Frank Mir, terrible trash talk, one of the best ever. Are these guys not good at it? No. But listen, I'm going to watch. You're going to watch. Bad trash talk is still better than two guys saying nice things about each other and then fighting. 
Right. But also you have to understand when people go on YouTube and they see a title that says Kamara Usman and Colby Covington need to be separated by security while they're in the booth. And then you watch what actually happened. How many of those 1.5 million people were glad that they sat through that entire thing? I would say 300,000 of them were like, oh, that was awesome. That was tremendous. That's the point I'm trying to make here. I understand trash talk needs to right. happen at some point, but, but sometimes the fight itself is fascinating enough. And plus they already fought, almost got into a fist fight in a buffet line. They've already got hours and hours worth of promo potential with the trash talk they've already had. Do we need to hear the same promo and the same trash talk for months? But I that, don't think so. That 300,000 viewers that click on that is probably about 250,000 more viewers than they would have got if, if they didn't have him face off. And they just had Karen Bryant and Kam- uh, Kamar Ozen talking about how good Kobe Covington was. Right. But you also, uh, if we're going to play numbers, if you look at the post fight interviews from main eventers over the past several cards, Colby Covington finished, I think, in the bottom five, according to our good friend Jai Goodman. Uh, a lot of guys had one. We're talking about media scrums and post fight press conferences and stuff. Colby was was on the bottom compared to a lot of the people in the previous cards. But I digress. Kristen, your thoughts on this? Do we Do we need to see these guys? talk trash for two months to build this fight or have we already built this fight and you can even make an argument has it already sort of fizzled from from buffet gate i I definitely don't think that it's fizzled out but i actually agree with you i don't feel like we need to sit through two months of these guys trash talking each other because if you want to see what the trash talk is going to look like just watch the little espn plus clip on on youtube that seven minute clip is exactly what's going to be put in two months worth of trash talk and that is repetitive then it'll get fizzled out and then the fight loses its luster like no one will want to see it at that point because we've already regurgitated the exact same thing you saw how some of the exchanges between the two went it was more so like well yeah i told you so but no you didn't but yes i did but do you really want to hear that for the next two months i think i saw somebody also suggest that they host the next season of the ultimate fighter and i can't even believe like that would be a suggestion because that would be tiresome enough so no, I don't think that we need to have two, three months of this back and forth between the two because we've already seen it. We've been talking about it for quite a bit. And I mean, this fight has already said, has already been put in stone pretty much since last year. These guys were ready to go at it last year. I remember Kamaru Usman wanted to fight Colby Covington in Brazil of all places. He wanted that fight. So it's like, yes, do I want to see the fight? Yes, so we can finally squash whatever this would look like. But do I want to hear you guys talk about the exact same thing in that one training session about you getting dumped? No, I don't think that's important to anything at this point. And I just want to see the fight. So hopefully they make it in November. I think we could get it over with sooner than later. And hopefully uh, we get a good fight out of it. I think everyone's expecting that. So I, I just don't need you to talk. Just fight. That's it. If I want to see that kind of a tra- that kind of trash talk, I will watch the first 15 minutes of Pee Wee's Big Adventure when Pee Wee and Francis had their little argument over Pee Wee's bike. Um, 19 points apiece for Keith and Kristen, uh, Craig and Davidson with 18, very compelling arguments across the board. Uh, but let's put a bow on UFC Newark for the time being. It was a, it was a pretty fun card considering it was pretty thin to the casual eye. We actually had a very compelling final question last week, looking for the biggest storyline on UFC Newark. And it was kind of a struggle to get there, but you know, in terms of the card, there were fun fights. There were some brutal finishes. There were some, uh, some slick submissions, a cool Jersey moment with Jim Miller getting a quick win. There was a lot to like on this card, but you know me. I like the the under-the-radar stuff. I like the moments that that aren't getting enough play, not getting enough attention on Saturday night. What was that moment? What was that performance? What was that fight for you, Keith Schillen, that just isn't getting that tender love and care that it rightfully deserves? Well, there's only one answer, and it's the only one that mattered to the rankings. Other than the main event, you said other than the main event. It's Matt Snell. What Matt Snell did to Jordan Espinosa. This is a guy that was on a losing streak. He lost to freaking Hector Sandoval, was looking like he's about to c- get cut from the UFC. Instead, t- somehow turns it around. He's won four fights in a row. He's won back-to-back stoppage victories. And he was heading into this fight. He was ranked 14th in the rankings. He just took out number nine. But if you actually go through the rankings, the, some of the people that will probably be I – mean, he'll probably take number nine now. The people ahead of him are guys like Tim Elliott and Sergio Pettis. Guys are not even – flyweights anymore so really he's probably seventh now in the rankings he this guy is one or two wins away from possibly getting a title shot now a guy like davis i know who davis is gonna say davis is gonna say knocker uh nazara hawker yeah yeah it was a very impressive knockout of joe kim silva but it does nothing to the rankings i mean he could have knocked out anderson silva and he still ain't moving up the lightweight rankings i mean 
what's the next matchup for him? Lando Venata for the number 40th ranked spot, you know, in the lightweight rankings. The only person that actually moved up in rankings and, and, and did something and is actually close to a title fight now is Matt Snell. Davidson, your thoughts. Who is your uh, kind of under-the-radar performer, under-the-radar fight? Which, which fight, storyline, fight her is just not getting the love that, that it should be getting on this Monday evening? First off, shame, shame on you, Keith, because we both agreed Nazareth Hawkfrost and Lando Venato would be fun to watch. However, I do ultimately agree with you. I think Matt Schnell is the guy in the, uh, to answer this question for here. Keith said it, you're one or two wins away from a title shot. That old stig stigma that used to kind of follow around those 185ers that moved up to 205. You know, you're one big win away, two big wins away from potentially getting a title shot. Honestly, that is exactly what flyweight kind of contains at the moment, given the nature of the division. And Schnell, not only four straight wins, he was, he was knocking on the door of losing his spot on the roster, going into a fight, uh, UFC 216, I, th I think it was against Marco Beltran. And wins that fight, wins his next fight, and now he's triangle choked uh, Luis Tomolka and uh, Jordan Espinoza inside of three minutes, albeit, in back-to-back -back fights. Um, I, I, ha I have to agree. I think Matt Schnell is the guy here. I, I actually thought that fight should have been a little bit higher on the card as well. Um, you know, given maybe the winner of Alex Perez and Sergio Pettis next and creep into that top five, hey, man, you got a title contender on your hands. Craig, I see that you have typed in rebuttal in the chat. Um, does that it mean you count want... now? What's that? It doesn't count now. Now it's my turn. I was just going to say, how did you want to handle this whole thing? Was there I, I didn't see it. I didn't mean to cut you off. I'll go two ways. So, A, uh, Tim Elliott hasn't fought since 2017, says he's got a fight announced. He's realistically one to two fights away from a title shot. So, realistically, Matt Schnell, though he's marketed himself well after the win, especially on Ariel Hawani's show, but his post-fight speech was really good. I'm going to disagree here. I have a guy who hasn't lost a fight since 2007. He's on an insane win streak. He's won 14 in a row. He's been in the UFC since 2014, and he just keeps piling up finishes. Oh, and by the way, he's got a win over Leon Edwards, who's starting to creep into title contention. That man's Claudio Silva, and he looked great this weekend. And if this guy can pull together some wins and some fights, and he says that he's totally healthy, and I totally believe him, I mean, the win over Danny Roberts, that was what? Earlier on this year. So it's it's a third round finish. Then this one over Cole Williams. Yeah, it was on short notice, but Cole Williams weighed in. At what what was he? Super welterweight is what he weighed in at. And Claudio Silva was able to put him away in the first round. So realistically, this is a guy at 36 years old. It's, it's all or nothing for him. His window is going to start to close as his age continues to go up. And he just looks super impressive. So for me, Claudio Silva is a guy that you really have to pay attention to. I know he's not in that title contention like Matt Schnell might be, but a few wins, I mean, that welterweight uh, um, ranking system, it's wide open. So he could he could really, really raise his stock, and I believe that he did with the win this week. Kristen, what do you think? Yeah, so well, coming in here, I knew that everyone was going to say Matt Schnell because he made a wonderful argument about his uh, division. Obviously, flyweight has a lot of problems. But uh, in one of his interviews, I think with Aaron Bronstetter, he made the point of signing a lot more people in flyweight so that there could be competition for him because he is reaching that point where he's about to become uh, an even greater contender than he already is. So that's why I came with the second answer, because I knew everyone was going to take the first answer of Matt Schnell. So I'm going to go ahead and say that Antonina Shevchenko impressed me a lot because I think that now that she has this first finish in the UFC, it looks great. Um, I think for her, especially in a division like women's flyweight, it's fun right now, but it is also a little bit um, shallow. So if she is able to get like a win over that, uh, a woman like her last opponent, that was awesome. So I would honestly uh, set her up with Lauren Murphy. She won on the same card. I know she wants a top 10 contender, but you know what? Antonina is right behind her. I think she's ranked at like number 14 or 15. And I think it'd be a good clash of styles over there. So I was most impressed with uh, Antonina Shevchenko. Yeah, I think my my end of the radar moment was that fight between the two of them. That was a that was a great fight. You know, Shevchenko had that nasty deep armbar in, and Pudalova got back up to her feet, and they started banging again. That was that was a great fight. Now I have to go back and try to dissect what has happened here. So Craig had a pre buttle so to speak. So I guess we're gonna start with you, Craig. You're the first rebuttaler here, or was your answer like a combination of the two? You're shaking your head. No, uh, I mean, yeah, I'm I'm good. I'm good. All right, you're good. So Davidson. 
Davidson said rebut, then rebuttal. So go ahead. So let me just get this out of the way first. Obviously, being 5-0 at 170 pounds in the UFC is impressive. Obviously, having a win over a guy like Leon Edwards is impressive. Let me tell you what's not impressive. How about a guy coming in that looked like he filled the role of a dad in a family sitcom who missed weight by six pounds to begin with and also hadn't picked up a win or had only picked up one win in his last 28 months. I'm just saying while it was impressive and obviously anybody looking at those two with any knowledge of either of those guys' background could understand why Claudio Silva was able to get him down and choke him out in the first round. Do I disagree with Craig that Claudio Silva is heading in that the direction that he said? No. But come on, man. He beat a he beat Cole Williams. The guy the guy looked like he just got off the couch. Like, come on. Craig, do you have a response to that since he rebutted against you? I mean, realistically, Davidson just made my point for him. He beat a guy that was six pounds heavier than him in the first round. Uh, Cole Williams' last win was over a guy named Charlie Brown. And listen, I mean, it was the worst loss for a guy like Charlie Brown since Lucy pulled the football away. So it was able to springboard Cole Williams into the UFC to take on Claudio Silva, which made Claudio Silva look even better now that he's able to string together performances like this, including finishes on a 14-fight win streak. And ultimately, he's going to get a top 20 type of guy. So thanks, David. Well, two fights before that, he beat 6-17 and 17 John Kennedy. So to Nobody each- gives a rip, Davidson. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> and Keith, we are well aware. We are all aware that you have a rebuttal. We wanted to set you up perfectly. We want to put the ball on the tee for the star of the show, Keith. You got the yellow walls behind you. We saw great rants from you with the yellow walls before. Go ahead. Maybe unmute your mic and... Uh... <laughs> listen, listen. I'm all I'm all the flushy because you messed up the order. I was supposed to rebuttal before Craig. I had a whole bunch of Charlie Brown chokes. I can't do them now. Listen, um, Craig had one of the worst answers in history. Claudia Silva. There's a reason why this guy was second on the card, right ahead against uh, the Alex Nicholson's punching bag. I mean, give me a, give me a break, dude. Uh, yeah, I said it. Uh, uh, Claudia Silva. He 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 hasn't lost in since 2014 or 2007, whatever he said, he took four years off. That's like when Frank Shamrock like was retired for 10 years and he finally lost. He's like, well, I've been, I've been undefeated for 13 years. You know, dude, I, I fought back in 2007. I guess I'm undefeated for 12 years now. Um, I mean, that was ridiculous. I mean, like you said, the guy, the guy was making his UFC debut. I don't think why Davidson even mentioned it. he was making his debut on like four days notice. And he's, he's, he missed weight because he weighed in. He, first of all, he, he dropped down a weight class that he never fought at. He came in overweight. He came off a win off of Charlie Brown. I mean, seriously, I would have been more impressed if Claudius Silva beat Linus and Snoopy than friggin' uh, – what was the guy's name? Cole Williams? I mean, you better beat Robin Williams. And then what the hell is – what the hell is Kristen talking about? Antoine and Shevchenko. I'm actually big on Shevchenko. I'm actually still on our train. She beat Lucy freaking Pudelover. Pudelover's two and four in the UFC. She's lost three fights in a row. I mean, that's not an impressive win. And and listen, I'm still I still can't believe Craig's answer. I mean, talking about he beat Leon Evans in 2014. 2014, Bill Cosby was the number one comedian in the world. Like, give me a break. Jeez, oh, wow, Craig. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know. Did did he prove your answer as well? I mean realistically yeah because i think bill cosby was already in murky waters in 2014 so there's there's strike one against you maybe he was the number one comedian in rhode island up here in canada it's all french canadian comedians and you probably wouldn't understand what they're saying but realistically i mean i thought he put on a good performance he had really really terrible um injury woes that he had to fight through and this is a guy that yeah he's competing for brazil he trains out of the uk so you can market him as a brazilian and a uk star just like johnny walker when he came out in the uk kit and he's Brazilian, and now he's going to fight in one of the biggest fights of his life. So, yeah, I think Claudio Silva had a better showing than Matt Schnell. I I mean, at the end of the day, who are people going to remember? Matt Schnell or Claudio Silva? They're going to remember Claudio Silva. Oh, my gosh. All right, 28 points apiece for Keith, Kristen, and Davidson. Craig with 27 as we head to the final question of round one before we say goodbye uh, to one of our great competitors, the – the story of the weekend was not UFC Newark. Story of the weekend was the, as it looks at this very moment, 
the culmination of the Dana White and Chris Cyborg story. So Cyborg earlier in the week after going on a bunch of different podcasts that we're not going to mention like Ariel show, because it's not in the Loudmouth MMA podcast network and talking about bullying and all these things. These are all things that we've been hearing about for a long time now. She releases a video of a conversation she has backstage with Dana White at UFC 239. And this is a video that had a lot of people screaming tomfoolery. My first thought was, where's the next five to 10 seconds? It's like that video with the guy on the golf course hang, holding on to the little crocodile. And then you see this big crocodile heading down the green towards him. And we want to know what the next five to 10 seconds of that video was. That's what I thought. But it turns out that I was right, as are many others. But we're going to get to that in a moment. So on Friday, a video is released. Dana White does a sit-down interview with Laura Sanko, where he is trying to talk about all the comings and goings of the UFC. And Chris Cyborg is a major part of this conversation. Dana White's trying to defend things that he said about Chris Cyborg in the past, most notably the Vandalay Silva and address comment. I'm sorry, no matter what Dana White says, he'll never be able to justify that comment, in my opinion. But more was said, but the end game was the UFC was no longer in the Chris Cyborg business and they were releasing her and she is free to go wherever she wants. The other shoe, Chris Cyborg admitted to doctoring the video and then the rest of it was released with Dana White trying to tell her essentially, look, I know you're not scared. I'm not trying to say anything bad about you. You've seen the video. So my question to the esteemed panel is, and we're going to start with Davidson here. When you put ear to pillow on Friday night and you were getting ready to count those sheep and you drank that warm glass of milk, who was looking worse in your mind, Dana White or Chris Cyborg and why? First off, let me correct you. Cold glass of milk. Oh. Warm milk. Um, you know, in terms of who was wrong, I don't know if I would personally pen either side as wrong per se. I would just pen them both as filling the proverbial roles that they are. I mean, Dana White lied to the public about Chris Cyborg being scared. And did, did anyone who really believe that Chris Cyborg was scared of Amanda Nunes? No. And when Brett Okamoto asked him about it, he, he looked at, he looked at him and he said, come on, you really think I'm not trying to make that fight? Do you really think, do you, do you really think that that's not what's trying to happen here? And the reason why these lies are said and the, the reason why public perception is the way that it is, is because it's all a big negotiation tactic. All of it, all of the smoke and all of the fire is all just one under one big umbrella that comes down to dollars and cents or could come down to whether or not um, Cyborg really only wanted to extend her contract by one fight. Obviously something the UFC would have no interest in doing because what if she beat Amanda, then you have a really bad situation on your hands. So, I mean, as far as like, it was Dana quote unquote wrong for doing a couple of things, not pre 2015 with cyborg but recently okay maybe and was cyborg wrong for editing the video per se i mean she wasn't going to do anything else she's trying to make her she has penned multiple times she is trying to expand her brand and i think that's exactly what she was trying to do here and i think dana was just looking out for the brand that he's built up as well all right craig what do you think about the cyborg dana white situation on friday who I guess who came out of that whole thing? Cause at first Dana's interview, everyone was ripping Dana to shreds and then the whole thing with cyborg admitting to doctoring the video, which I thought, you know, was pretty cool on her part to actually, you know, admit to the wrongdoing and, and release the actual video, but still who looked worse in your opinion, especially when so many people were sour on Dana white, like five hours earlier. Who doesn't love a sensationalized article title that I read today and wanted to share, but didn't share, but I'm going to share it now. Chris Cyborg booted from UFC over Dana White drama. Is that really why she was booted? Nah, I guess. Mike, I'm going to ask you a question. You already answered the question, but did Dana White doctor a video publicly make up lies about Chris Cyborg? No. No, he didn't. But Chris Cyborg did, and she she said it wasn't her. She, she did a good job of trying to cover it up. She said, oh, it was a member of my team. But you definitely know what's going on if it's a member of your team. Surprisingly... Though it was somebody from her team, all we're focusing on, we're not focusing on her win, which last week I said, listen, it was a great performance. It was a throwback cyborg. She threw caution to the win, tons of volume, and had a great performance. We're not talking about that. We're talking about how Chris Cyborg is going to lose out on dollars and cents when she decides to go over to Bellator or one or PFL. And we're talking about how Dana White did, yeah, it was a bit of a doctored interview, if you will, with Laura Sanko, UFC on UFC. But that's what you have to expect when you have something like that. So if we go back to what Davidson said, because I fell asleep when he was talking, and I realistically have to drink some of Gary Copeland's special stuff to finish this. There we go. Yeah, 
All right. So, yeah. Who looks worse? Chris Cyborg looks worse. She has less, or sorry, she has more to lose in this situation than Dana White does. So Chris Cyborg loses. And ultimately, hopefully, I can dig myself out of the grave that I've already dug for myself. What is going on over there? Who is breathing heavy? Is that you, Davidson? Putting your mic back on? Good Lord. Sound like you were running through a tornado. Kristen, your thoughts on this situation? Yeah, uh, I actually agree with Craig, and it's not surprising, honestly. But I say that Chris looks bad only by a slight margin. Honestly, the picture that she's trying to paint of Dana White has already been painted several times before. We've already known that there are ways that Dana has twisted the truth here and there when it comes to creating the narrative that he wants to be out in public. So I understand trying to reinforce that idea. However, by doing that and trying to mislead people, the same thing you're upset at Dana for doing, it just looks bad on your part because listen, nine times out of 10, people are gonna be on your side no matter what. There's always gonna be those guys that are always gonna bring up you know, her, her history as to why they can't support her and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, I don't think anyone was gonna go against Chris Cyborg. Obviously she wanted that fight with Amanda Nunes and obviously this was a big negotiation tactic. But at some point, you cannot fall into the trap that Dana White has set and that's exactly what she did. She misled the people by that doctored video and I understand that she apologized for it, However, you have to bear responsibility. It is your team. There is no way that that video could have gone up without you seeing it at first. And if you knew that there was a problem that needed to be corrected, you should have done so sooner. Instead, now it makes you look a little bit like a liar. And I don't think that that's the kind of image you want portrayed. You want people to think that, hey, Chris Cyborg is an honest person. She wants this rematch. And that's what the story should have been. Instead, we're arguing about whether or not she may have done the exact same thing that Dana was doing to her. And now they both look bad. So it, it was just bad on her part to do that as well as her team. I think they should also share some blame in this because that's what they clearly were going for. And it really did backfire. So I, it's unfortunate that she's no longer in the UFC. I hope that that's just really a negotiation ploy because uh, I'd love to see that rematch with Amanda Nunes, but it looks like that is slipping away further and further every day. And maybe we could see her back with uh, Scott Coker and Bellator. That'd be awesome too. Keith with his UFC shirt on. How do you respond to this? Uh, so listen, there's actually two really um, huge free agent females out there right now. Chris Cyborg's a free agent and Kristen King just announced her free agency right here on the show because, I mean, cause <laughs> listen, because you know when she says something negative about Chris Cyborg, see you later, Amy Kaplan is firing you. So listen, uh, MMA Junkie, Sure Dog, uh, all, you know, Bleacher Report, all you guys out there, Kristen King, one of the best, I think she's one of the best writers out there. She is now a free agent. Um, listen, I, who looked bad? I think they both look bad. Let's be honest. So Dana White is going to talk about, oh, he's going to bring up steroid use and Chris Cyborg and, and all this stuff and, and pretend like he cared about her steroid abuse. Well, if you cared about her steroid in 2014, why did you sign her and then sign her again? Resign her. Like, it makes you look bad. Now, let's go to Chris Cyborg. You talk about Dana bullying you and, oh, I need to get apology for things he said because I look like Vandalay Silver and all this stuff. If you really cared, why did you sign with the UFC? And then why did you re-sign with the UFC? Like, that made him look like they're both, like, going back. It's like, it's going, like, you know, that, that time you checked out a, you know, you flirted with a girl at a party in 2010 and your wife keeps bringing it up. I mean, baby, let it go. It was 2010. Uh, I mean, that's, that's when, that's, that's the last time Claudia still fought in the UFC. Anyways, Evan <laughs> said it. When you, when you edit a video, it's going to make you look bad, whether she apologizes or not. It's going to make her look bad. But you know why Dana wins? Dana wins because of this. Because all the chips are in his court. Amanda Nunes won. No matter where Cyborg goes, the invincibility is erased. She is no longer that scary Terminator. It's, oh, yeah, she was cool. Our champion knocked her out in a minute. Oh, she just won Bellator? Cool, our champion knocked her out in a minute. Oh, she just won a million dollars? Cool, our champion knocked her out in a minute. Oh, we want to set up the rematch. She didn't want it. You know, we, we tried setting it up. Amanda Nunes wanted it. But here is the biggest reason why Dana White went, and he's brilliant for doing this, because it became personal. He just made her lose money by, doing, by going out and, with Laura Sanko and saying, we're not going to match an offer. Well, guess what? Bellator, what he, they were going to offer her, 
They don't have to go as high anymore because their biggest rival is not matching their offer. If the Red Sox and the Yankees both going after free agent and the Yankees say, yeah, we're not going to sign said free agent. Well, the Red Sox ain't going to have to pay as much now. So Dana is the master. You make it personal, Dana, you're going to lose. And Chris Leiborg lost where it matters most in her pocket. And you know what I thought of going to bed on Friday night? Book Cyborg Nunez 2 in December, because that's what I think is going to happen. Am I crazy for thinking that, Craig Allen? Because that's the conclusion I came up with. I think both sides admitted fault in some way. Chris Cyborg sends the good video. Dana White goes on social media and thanks Chris Cyborg for, you know, for her integrity that she showed. I think she's coming back. Am I nuts? You are nuts, and I'm glad I didn't have to use my rebuttal on this because this is a Hail Mary, and I have props for this one. So, realistically, if we go on to Chris Cyborg's Instagram, we know how prolific she is. Uh, hi, Twitter. Hi, Twitter. What do you think about donuts on popcorn? I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense because it's not her running it. But this is on her Instagram right now. I had a great run in the UFC, but really that didn't matter because I built my brand, and I quote, Elite XC era, Strike Force era, Invict FC, UFC were all successful. We will be starting new era soon. I have great news about this, blah, blah, blah. If you want to make the dineros, you got to go somewhere else. And now Bellator isn't going to pay her as much due to all of the shenanigans that she's pulling. Her social media team has made her look good. They've built engagement on social media. Those stupid high Twitter, as much as I dislike them, realistically, a lot of people do like them and it gets the conversation going. She's selling a fight. But it comes to bite you in the ass when you have negativity and you're doctoring. Yeah, okay, Keith's saying it was $4. It's actually uh, $17 American, not even Canadian money. Look at that. That's dedication. That's how much I care about the show. But realistically, Chris Cyborg's just doing more damage than she is doing good in this situation. How dare you, Craig? That was Kristen King who put that <laughs> comment out there. I know it's surprising. They both start with K's. I know you immediately thought Keith, and, and I totally get that. <laughs> Davidson, am I, am I nuts for coming to that conclusion? I think precedent has been set with way worse behavior than we're seeing between Dana and Cyborg now. Am I absolutely out of this world nuts for thinking that Chris Cyborg could be back to the UFC more so than I did a week ago? I won't be like, I, I won't say out of the world nuts, but a little bit. Yeah, I, I highly, highly doubt it. Um, just because of a couple of specific like soundbite or quotes you can take from sound bites from both of them. First off, I knew the moment Chris Cyborg said Davidson or duh, Dana White needs to apologize to me. As soon as she said that, I was like, okay, that ship sailed. That's done. That's a done deal. It's over. Um, Cause Dana's never going to do that. And as far as the precedent from behavior from others is concerned, obviously while Cyborg, she's like, or at least she was in the realm of the Holly Holm fight and the Yana Kunitskaya fight. People were debating whether or not she was a draw, but obviously Conor McGregor, who you can like compare the quote unquote behavior stick to, um, is the most lucrative draw the sport may ever see. So as, as far as, you know, the precedent being set in the past with behavior, it just really matters what kind of dollars and cents you bring in for the company. And Cyborg didn't do that to the level that Dana could give her a pass on. Keith, do you still think Bellator is the favorite here? I didn't think you were the favorite. I'm still sticking with what my answer was last week. It's the time. It's the time to go to WWE. Take out Ronda. Take out Vince McMahon. Take out freaking Flair's daughter and this broad with fake boobs and that broad with fake boobs. Chris Cyborg could be the 2019 version of China picking, like having matches against guys and suplexing friggin' John Cena. It'd be fantastic. She's getting old. She'll make more money. Just, listen, I didn't even watch WF, but I think Chris Cyborg would be the perfect signing for the WWF. I think WWE, WWE, whatever. And bring, think, and bring Kane Velasquez. Have, I think you have muted Raw as we speak, Keith. That's we right. Heard, we heard your wrestling on. We, I still, I've screenshotted that Skype chat from last week. You named like every wrestler that ever stepped foot in a squared circle. Kristen, do you think Chris Cyborg ever fights in the UFC again? Um, I hope so. I just don't know how realistic that is, at least right now. And it's probably because of recency bias after everything that's happened. Um, I'm grasping to like the smallest straw there is possible, but 
when Chris admitted that she did doctor that uh, video, Dana responded to her just saying, thank you for admitting that you did that. So maybe that's just kind of like, I, I don't know, like a small reflection of their relationship, I guess. It, it could be contentious at some point, but they could come together. It just depends on the situation. But just right now, I don't see it happening. Perhaps in December, I didn't really think about that. So that's actually a good idea. And I think it'd be almost a year since the last time that Amanda and, and her fought. So I think that'd be a good uh, story behind it. So, I, I mean, I'd hope that it happened, but I honestly feel like Bellator is a great idea. And that WWE idea, uh, it, it is something to behold. I, I could definitely see Chris Cyborg in there. She doesn't have to talk on the mic. She could have her valet talk for her. She could have some kind of Paul Heyman type for her and uh, just let her do what she's been wanting to do to Ronda. And, and that'd be, honestly, I'd give that money. I, I would watch a pay-per-view with that too. So let, let's see where it happens. I, I honestly don't know at this point. You know where Chris Cyborg would have fit in perfectly in the pro wrestling world? ECW. That's where she would have fit in perfectly. She would have, those fans that were in the ECW arena would all know who Chris Cyborg was. Every single one of them. You put her down in the WWE universe, most people aren't going to know who Chris Cyborg is. I said that last week, and I stand by that decision. Um, in terms of the scoring, because Craig you know, only has $4 to his name, I think he needs more screen time. So I'm going to give him the 10 points in that round, and we have a four-way tie heading into the final question. So we're going to eliminate not one but two people heading into the finals. The final question of regulation, regulation because, as we know, there is no rest for the UFC. They are back at it on Saturday in Uruguay for an event on ESPN+. It will be headlined by a pretty, by a title fight at least. Valentina Shevchenko defending the women's flyweight title against Liz Carmouche. The co-main event is a really fun fight between Mike Perry and Vicente Luque, which no doubt about it, that fight's going to be really exciting. But if you really look at, especially in the prelim portion of this card, there are some, some other pretty fun matchups out there. But in terms of cards and who is on them and like what the MMA media is talking about, I honestly can't remember a fight card, especially with a championship headliner, getting as little play as this fight card has been getting heading into Saturday. So my question is, besides the title fight and besides the Perry Luque fight, what fight, what storyline, what fighter on the card are you most interested in getting the result to in Uruguay on Saturday? Craig Allen. Mike, before the show began, we were in the lobby of the chat and you and I were having a conversation and I said, how in the, f is there this guy on this card? I mean, it makes sense because he's from the country. Luis Eduardo Garagori uh, beat two guys. His last two wins were over guys who were making the pro MMA debuts. This guy's billed as a striker, as a finisher. They're going to push him as a big fighter, but like Diego Rivas in Chile, this guy's not going to be able to provide the type of moxie that you're going to expect from a guy in his home country, in his hometown even, fighting. Davidson Baker says he's the favorite. I know, it's ridiculous. So to backpedal a little bit, I'm going to talk to you about a guy that's been fighting for a Canadian promotion that's come under fire for not letting fighters go to the UFC. This guy's 3-0. and oh, he trains out of, and you'll recognize this, the MMA factory. Why, you say? Mikel Labou, Francis Ngannou, Cyril Gane is going to be taking on another man, Rafael Pizal, in his UFC debut. And listen, if you look at Cyril Gane, all three of his wins are finishes, and he beat Adam Dykesa, a guy who many were saying, this guy is the future of not just Canadian MMA, but heavyweight MMA. This is a guy that you have to pay attention to. Right now, since that loss, Adam Dykes is going into boxing because he can't make a living off of MMA. He's just, it's not cutting the mustard for him right now. Cyril Gane is such a big guy. I mean, he's six foot five, he's an 83 inch reach. This is a guy that could follow in the footsteps of Francis Ngannou. And this is a guy that you're going to see in the top 10 of the UFC's heavyweight rankings, which I might add needs a breath of fresh air. And he's going to be the guy to do it, especially a guy representing France. And France, currently doesn't have MMA legal in the country. Here's another star that you can build around and try and push that movement, especially with the fire kid, Tom Duquenois, recently announcing retirement. All right, Kristen, what is your under the radar story on a car that is completely flying under the radar? I know it's hard to pick one, but um, I think for me, it'd be the fight between Volkan Oezdemir and Elia Latifi. I mean, we've been trying to get this fight happening for the longest time. And it, obviously there's been like travel issues. There's been injuries. There's been so many things keeping this fight from happening. And now we finally get it, unless I just jinxed it by saying how excited I am about it. Hopefully not. 
But um, listen, there's a lot of fun matchups at light heavyweight right now. And that's crazy to say, because a few years ago, there really wasn't that much to look at. I mean, at that point, we kind of just knew that whoever the champion was at that point, and that was John Jones, obviously, we just kind of knew that there was really no challenge for him at all. So to be able to see that there are several light heavyweight matchups that could be that could very well be number one contender fights, like a Dominic Reyes versus Chris Weidman, like a Vulcan Oesdemir versus Alir Latifi, you know, like a Corey Anderson versus Johnny Walker that was announced, I think, yesterday or today. There are so many things happening in light heavyweight, and that's just what makes it so interesting. Now we finally have a bunch of contenders that be, that do have a great chance at dethroning the champion. So put them all together, put them against each other, and see what happens. I'm excited for this to happen because I just think the Clash of Styles is amazing. I feel like someone might be knocked out in this fight. Or it could go all three rounds. We just don't know. And that's the beauty of it. We don't know what's going to happen. And I feel like with the amount of times it's been canceled, a lot of people are like, damn it, I want to watch it already. So now that it's finally here, we can see it. We can have a lot of answers move, or, or we can have a lot of answers for the fight. And then we could see who moves up or who moves down in the light heavyweight division. Because right now, I think it's the most fun that it's been. So I hopefully we get a good fight out of this one. Yeah, it's interesting. Who moves up and then who really just fades out of relevancy altogether. Davidson, you just look so fired up right now. You have that look in your eye. I'm, I'm going to let you go, man. Too bad Craig is ruining literally all of my possible answers. First off, he says my original answer in Cyril Ghana. Then he goes in the chat and takes my replacement answer. And yes, both of these guys are going to be newcomers this weekend. But let me go ahead and go on the record. Let me go ahead and go on the record and make a prediction right now. Cyril Gane and Rodolfo Vieira will both be in the top 10 of their divisions in 18 months' time. Be, and here's why. Cyril Gane, I mean, you know, Craig Allen said it already. The connection between Nganu and, and Gane, just even beyond the fact that their last names already ironically sound very similar. I mean, 83-inch reach. Hits like a truck. Adam Deichka, the guy that Cyril Gane took out in, the T, in TKO – was 9-0, and was probably on the doorstep of winning or of going to the UFC, and Gane went in there and starched him, just absolutely ran through them. This is a guy that is absolutely going to make waves in the heavyweight division. And if, as far as Hadolfo Vieira is concerned, he's on the main card with Oscar Pijota for a reason. How about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7? Yes, I had to count them. Seven World Cup gold medals in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, five-time IBJJF Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu gold medalist, He's immediately stepping into the middleweight division and becoming one of, if not the most, most effective and the most dangerous ground fighters in the world. And yes, the 2015 ADCC champion too. I've got to thank Craig for helping me out a lot here with making my point. Even though it's not the popular answers, I think, it, like I said, 18 months, Adolfo Vieira, Cyril Gane, both in the top 10 in their divisions. Keith looks like a pit bull. That sees a big piece of steak about 20 feet away from him, but he can't quite get there. So allow me, Keith, to metaphorically and virtually take the collar off. Go ahead, sir. Well, we're talking about UFC Uruguay, right? I mean, Craig's excited about UFC Uruguay because it's the only place less known than where he lives. Uh, Freaking Davison saying, oh, 10 times this, four times that. Listen, Davison, I got a record for you. You're a 10 time. First person eliminated off this show, and you're going to be 11 now. Um, I mean, look at these answers. I mean, I'm looking through the card. They got uh, Geraldo De Freitas versus Chris Gutierrez. Like, I, I, is this a UFC card, or is that like a main event for a bare-knuckle boxing? Um, like, from a ranking sense, the best fight on the card is, from a ranking sense, is Uzumir and Latifi. But, I mean, I'm supposed to be excited about one guy that's lost three in a row and Latifi that's, that's, that's coming off a loss himself. Um, they're talking about Ghana and how great he is. I'm so in this, this is a, and 18 months from now, they might get in the fat guys top 10. Like we got to wait 18 months until they're top 10 guys. I mean, there's, there's other people in the card that are good fighters. Marina Rodriguez getting her toughest test and Tisha Torres, you know, I like flyweights with Piver and Botorian and, Gilbert Burns is back fighting on the same week that his brother is fighting, trying to get in the UFC. Um, I'm going to cheat a little bit because we're talking about UFC, UFC Uruguay. It's not a good card. It's not excited about it. The PFL has a better fight in Calvin Terrell and, and Gossa. They're the two best uh, heavyweights in that uh, division. They're going against each other. 
But I'm still not excited about that. This stuff happens every week, but there's something that doesn't happen every week that we're not talking about. The guys we're talking about, champ, uh, 10 this, 10, listen, none of these guys are world champions. None of these guys are the greatest ever. None of these guys have won, I don't know, say like six championships. There's only one thing I'm excited about this week. It goes down this Thursday. Tom Brady and my boys returning preseason, 42 years old, going to get another championship. There's only one thing where you get to witness absolute greatness, the greatest to ever do it. He's stepping on the field once again. We've been waiting since February to see it. Tom Brady returns. That's the only thing to get excited about. And I just punched my ticket into the finals. You know, I went and saw the new Child's Play movie. And I actually had read some reviews and people had told me, like, listen, you know, you may not think it's going to be good, but, you know, it's really, really good. Like, this, this movie is outstanding. Like, it, it's, it's, it's better than the first one. It's better than the original. And then I go in and see it, and it's the biggest piece of shit I've ever seen in my entire life. That's what I'm comparing Keith's answer to after that buildup, after what you just said to me on Facebook Messenger. you got to let me go last on that last question. Yep, opening up the fourth wall, ladies and gentlemen. Keith asked me to go last, and you come up with Tom Brady. Listen, I love Tom Brady as much as the next guy. I get every Tom Brady jersey in my closet right now. But come on, Keith. You did that to me? How dare you? Yeah, I, I should get excited. Brady on two drives. Yeah, two I should get drives. excited. I should get excited about seeing uh, 3 0 Gane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, Tom Brady. He will. There's, there's only a couple of times left. Tom Brady, that's the answer. Listen, you're not. A, if I'm not in the finals, you're not a shooting. He's going to go three for three for 18 yards. Listen, out. It's still he, better than watching the prelims of the Gilbert de Freitas. <laughs> that's actually going to be a pretty good fight. Even Brandon Fitzgerald think that's, thinks that's going to be a good fight. Um, Keith, we're going to say goodbye to you, man. It's your fault. You built me up too much, man. You built me up too much. Well, you, first of all, one I'm going I'm to address something right now. Because I feel like this is the worst decision since that Darko story. I'm shocked by this. And you know what? I'm going to go full Darko story. I'm going to kick all three of you guys in the nuts. I got three going shots. And you know what? We should have a golden buzzer because everyone knows <laughs> Everyone knows. I had one line tonight that should have been the American Scott Town in the finals golden buzzer. And, uh, yeah, hey, uh, good luck to all you guys. Listen, we all know Chris, there's no way Mike's not going to pick the female to win. So uh, good luck to you guys. All right. Uh, thank you, Keith. Um, despite him only having $4 to his name, Craig Allen, uh, we got to let you go as well, my man. You did a great job tonight. Uh, it was close, but – Davidson got very fired up today. I think the facial expressions throughout the show got to me tonight. So uh, any parting words for the people? Uh, I mean, look forward to Luis Eduardo Garagori on your main card, a guy who's not going to amount to diddly squat. And other than Uruguayans, nobody wants to see this fight. I mean, Keith would rather watch football, and I've got no say in the matter. Uh, big Baker Mayfield fan here. So hopefully everybody has a good week, and uh, – Good luck to Kristen, but more importantly, Davidson's turned a new leaf at the age of 23, so I'm really afraid of this guy. I mean, I put on some decent performances and got pretty far in the show, but now I'm three weeks not even making to the finals, so I don't know. Again, i got to drink more of that uh, Gary Coleman water. Yeah, and full disclosure, I can't kick Davidson Baker off the show and not have him in the finals just days after his birthday. That would just be un-American of me. But Craig is just gone. He didn't want to hear the excuses, so... Uh, so we got Davidson versus Kristen in the finals. But before we head to the finals, your weekly reminder to subscribe to the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network, where not only do you get this fine soon-to-be award-winning podcast and program, but also the great other pieces of content that can be found on this network that will have you debating things like crazy. For instance, would you rather see Chris Cyborg fight for PFL or have them freak show fights in Ryzen? Take a guess which side our guy Fred Kirby is on. You can find out. They answer that question and many more This on this week's episode of the Not Safe for Work MMA podcast. You, of course, get the breakdown shows with Marcel Dorf and Max Friedman. And, of course, the Sunday morning corner man with John Franklin, who is in the chat with us right now, who is on the screen with us right now. You can't see him. He's such a massive piece of the show on the production side of things. He hosts that show alongside our guy Keith Schillen. So you can get these shows. And from what I understand, many more to come on the Loudmouth MMA podcast network by subscribing to the network on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or whatever it is you find your favorite podcast, make sure you give the YouTube channel a subscribe as well as we head to the final question. And I wanted to talk about this, but before we do that, we have to figure out which order we're going. So, Kristen, I need you to pick a number between 1 and 20. Uh, 2. And Davidson, 1 and 20. 3. 
That was well done. That was one done, Davidson, unless my number was one or two, but it was eight. So, Davidson, you have the choice to go first or second with this question. Clearly, I don't learn my lesson, so I'm going to go second. Davidson's going to go second. It's a big one because you neither of you have any idea where this is going. Not even John Franklin knows where this is going at this point because I haven't even told him what the final question is going to be. But here we go. We're going back to UFC Newark because – we have talked an awful lot about Colby Covington, and rightfully so. We've talked about what is next and the fallout of that fight and Kamara Usman and cringe and trash talk and all that stuff. But I want to talk about Robbie Lawler in this final question because, you know, despite losing a pretty one-sided fight on Saturday, he seemed in good spirits. He was wearing some, some damage of the fight. But overall, considering how many strikes Colby Covington threw in that fight, he avoided a lot of those strikes in that fight. And the hunger seems to still be there for Ruthless Robbie Lawler to compete but he's probably not fighting for a, for a title anytime soon coming off his third consecutive loss, which I didn't even realize that was the first time he's ever lost three consecutive fights ever in his over 18 year MMA career. So fantasy matchmakers, you, what would you like to see next? What should be next for ruthless Robbie Lawler following his loss to Colby Covington, Kristen King? Well, you know what? I think we should get back to what we know and love of Robbie Lawler is that just pure unadulterated violence. So let's put him up against a striker. Let's put him up against someone who we know is not going to push him up against the cage and hold him there or pressure fight him. Let's have him stand against someone who is willing to box with him. And that's why he should be fighting the winner of Mike Perry and Vicente Luque. That's exactly who he should be fighting. Because at that point, we know that we're going to get a knockout no matter what. And if Robbie wins, then we can dispel this whole notion that, hey, maybe he's washed up. I've seen so many people say, you know what, I think it's time for Robbie to retire. Why? He didn't look terrible in the loss to uh, Covington. He just couldn't get going. And everyone knew that was probably going to happen. And that's fine. That's against a style that he's not necessarily found the answers to just yet. I know he said he's been working in the gym to figure it out. He said he's going back to the drawing board. But you know what? Why don't we just get back to some really fun matchups? And we know what that could produce. We know we could get a knockout out of that one. And we know Mike Perry's not going to push anyone up against the cage. We know Vicente, is, he, they're going to meet each other right in the middle of the cage. And that's what people want to see. And maybe that fifth round Lawler or the third round Lawler, I don't know if they're going to even put that as a main event of anything. It could be a fight night card. I don't know. That could sell. I'd watch it. Uh, we just know that that is going to go up against some really – heavy hitting people and that's who he should be fighting I, I know it sounds bad because of stuff like cte and stuff but you know what? He, he still has juice he still has juice let's completely throw away the idea that he's washed up because it's not true that's not true i thought that he looked fine in the loss to covington he just needs to get back to the kind of style that is what made him that killer that people were afraid of and he needs to fight another striker davidson you had this look on your face as if kristen just stole your puppy or stole your answer. Is that what happened here? Or are you are you playing some possum here? Do you have the, the magnificent poker face? Are you pushing all your chips in the middle right now? Not that good. At, I'm not that good at playing cards, unfortunately. Um, however, in lieu of also um, our eliminated friend Keith talking about being excited about Tom Brady, I'm going to audible once again, like I just did on the last answer, because yes, that was my answer. I think that's a fantastic answer. And here's where I'm going to go as a result. What does the UFC do to get their supposed future contenders into contendership? Well, they take a stab at offering them fights that most people wouldn't take. For example, Cowboy Cerrone, Darren Till, Leon Edwards, RDA. Um, I had another one, and I forgot it. Dam Damian Maya, Colby Covington. However, there is, there is something, obviously, about Robbie Lawler, the tenacity the the the, um, the ruthlessness, obviously, per se, given that that is his nickname, that does not imply that he would turn down fights of said nature. So that being said, give him a guy like Elizio Zaleski dos Santos. This is a guy that can't get anybody to fight him. This is a guy, or uh, he's booked against Li Jing Liang. So okay, the winner of that fight, I guess. So I, I would I would try to use now Robbie in that proverbial position. Because maybe, like, I agree, he's not lost his juice. He's not washed up. I think he performed formidably enough for me to say Robbie Lawler could still win fights against guys scattered in the top 20, 25 in the welterweight division. However, um, it's been in the game a long time, man. He's probably getting ready to devise that exit strategy. And I think the UFC understands that. Would, would a matchup with, with Dos Santos or Jing Liang be ideal for him? No. Do I think that that or 
Luke Gay or Perry makes sense? Yes. You know what? I'm going to throw, 